Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to another episode in the series, The Cross Questioned. And we are in this series looking at the different issues that pertain to those three days as found in the pages of the New Testament. And those three days are the day that Jesus is taken to be crucified, the day he's crucified, and the day that he resurrects from the dead. Those three days that we're looking at. And we've been going through it methodically and showing all the inconsistencies and errors and problems. And then we've offered you solutions that are more acceptable, not that we as Muslims agree or believe in this. In fact, we do not. But we are saying there are better theories. There are better explanations of the text than the ones that you are being told. The ones that people are giving you and saying, this is the truth. There are far better explanations that are more credible. But it must be understood that we as Muslims have a text that does not agree with what you find in the pages of the New Testament. In fact, we have a lot of problems with the New Testament. In fact, we have a lot of problems with the entire Bible. We have a lot of problems with many things. But one of the things that we are sure of is that a text should not be fooled with contradictions and errors and things that cannot be proved either mathematically, scientifically, or by history. And we find that the text that we have been given as evidence or proof of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is filled with countless mistakes and errors and misinterpretations, perhaps not only by the scribes and the writers of the early days, but more so by modern scholars and the clergy today. Now, last week we were looking at the theory that many people say within the Christian circles today, why would the disciples of the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, die for a lie if they didn't believe that he was really alive, really crucified, and really resurrected three days later? If they didn't believe this, they would never have died for him because they were persecuted because they believed in Jesus Christ. One of the famous things that Christians like to do is play that little persecution card. You see those old Western movies, and you see the man pulling out an ace from his sleeve. That's the ace in the sleeve that the Christians love to do. Whenever you hear them talk about anything, it's about oh, how we were persecuted when we tried to open up a church in India. How we were persecuted when we tried to open up a mission center in Africa. How we were persecuted in the history of the times past or how they were persecuted in the future. It's their persecution complex. If you do not persecute a Christian, he will beat himself up so that he can blame someone for persecuting him. They have a persecution complex. And if you don't do it, they will do it to themselves. And so the idea of the die for a lie story is a classic case of the persecution complex that Christianity has tried to use. Look how we suffered because the disciples early believed that Jesus was physically raised from the dead and that the story found in the Bible is true. And so they were terribly killed. They were tortured and suffered. Do you know what this truth is? It never happened. The people that are given by the Christians about who were killed as martyrs, one of the people we can maybe accept was actually killed as a martyr. All the rest, there is absolutely no evidence that they were killed for believing in Jesus as a God or believing in Jesus as a physically raised person that walked around Jerusalem or wherever else you want to put him at that time. So this story is something that we will keep for a future series where we'll deal with that by itself. But today we have a lot of people, you know, they will, when something happens in Egypt, especially Egypt seems to be in the news a lot, the church will say like, we had our church burnt down because the Muslims are persecuting the Christians in Egypt. But the news never records how many mosques have been burnt down, how many Muslims have been attacked. And this is just, again, normal, typical, stereotype, media style. We are the designated bad guys. And no matter what, if I sign a million dollar check right here, right now, to child welfare, to look after children that have no home, it will make page 20 of the New York Times. But if I steal your mobile phone, it will make page one. And this is the way the media is. But we're going off track. Let's get back to the text that we're actually looking at. In the text that we are looking at, 
We have the story of two people, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And it's very odd that we hear about these people before the crucifixion takes place, where they are named, and then we hear of them after the resurrection, the same day when they go and say, please can we take the body of Jesus down and bury him in the grave that we have purchased in that area. That's the end of it. You never hear of these two people again. Why bother putting them into the scene in the first place? But for whatever reason, they were written into the text. The question is, what happened to them? After these people came and asked for the body and sought the body of Jesus and buried it in the garden that belonged to Joseph Arimathea himself, we never see them again. And it makes us wonder what actually took place, what transpired. Was there some type of conspiracy involved? Did they come and visit the grave on that Friday evening or that Saturday? Or did they come on the Sunday or neither or all of the above? We do not have a single reference of what they did after that period of time. They are written out of the text and it should not surprise us that they were, of course, probably on their way to Galilee or somewhere else to go with this body, this person, whoever it might have been, according to the text, that is. So if we look at the text, it creates more suspicion on the idea that whoever it was that was bound to this tree or bound to the crucifix or bound to the scaffold was not, in fact, dead but alive. And so these two, being part of the conspiracy, managed to smuggle them off to wherever. Perhaps they went to Egypt. Perhaps they went to India. Who knows where they went? But the interesting thing is that we never hear of them again, which is very odd as far as I'm concerned. Many people will say, well, what's the issue with it? The issue is that they played such a vital role that surely people would want to question them. People would want to have an interrogation with them. The Jews would have wanted to interrogate them. The Greeks, even the Christians of the day, would want to speak to these people and say, what was it like when you came to that grave and you saw that no one was there? What was it like? Nothing. It disappears from the history books. It disappears from the Bible. It disappears from the narrative. So one of my role models, one of the people that influenced my decision-making into becoming a Muslim over a great period of time was the late Sheikh Ahmadideh. And the late Sheikh Ahmadideh used to often give his talk about the sign of Jonah. And the sign of Jonah was a very interesting talk that he would give. And everybody who's been a Muslim for a decent period of time knows this talk. And the story comes from Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 40. And when he delivered it, it was so dynamic that it put a smile on your dial. But the problem is a number of critics and I won't say from where they came, said to the late Sheikh Ahmadidat or to Dr. Zaki and I, you are agreeing with the Christians because you say that Jesus was alive, he was alive, he was alive, he was alive. Therefore, you are not following what the Quran is saying. And let's listen to what the text is and let's understand what they actually said and what people are choosing to hear what these comparative religion scholars said. So in Matthew chapter 12, the narrative goes, that there were certain scribes and Pharisees and they answered and said, Master, what sign will you give us? They were speaking to Jesus. But he answered them and said to them, you evil men and adulterous generation, you look for signs and you will get no sign, but you will get only one. And that is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so in Luke chapter 11, verse 29, we see that he gives a shorter version of the same narrative that we find. And it says, there shall be no sign given to you except for the sign of Jonah. No period of time is mentioned in Luke's version. Perhaps Luke had already figured it out and said, one, wait, there's not three days. That's not three days. And so he purposely decided not to write it in. But the sign of Jonah 
is concerning his being in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. When it has been presented to us, people will say it's the same thing as what Jesus went through. It's the same case. But when we look at it, there are no similarities between the two narratives. There are no similarities between Jonah and Jesus. Therefore, this is a false prophecy. It is a prophecy that was not fulfilled. And so if Jesus was buried on a Friday evening and resurrected on the Sunday morning, it is less than one day. It's probably less than a day. It's probably, if at the absolute most, one day and one night and a little bit maybe of the second night. But no more than one day and two nights, just to be on the side of being lenient. So he was not in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. If the sign of Jonah was to be partly there for part of three days and part of three nights, then he would have fulfilled this. But I'm not going to go into more of that because you really understand, you've heard the late Sheikh Ahmadirat and you've heard Dr. Zaki and I both explain this in details before. Now, Jonah went into the belly of the whale, as we know, alive and came out alive and there's no resurrection that ever took place. In fact, according to the earliest of the canonical gospels of Mark, there shall be no sign given to this generation with that he left them. So he doesn't even mention Jonah. Let's take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah rahman rahim. We are continuing with our series, The Cross Question. And before the break, we were talking about that famous line from Sheikh Ahmad Didat, from Dr. Zakir Naik, where they speak about how Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. And so the son of man be three days and three nights. We looked at the different versions, how each version chose to leave out different parts of that story of Jonah. Only one narrative gives it the fact that it will be three days and three nights. We look at even what Mark says in Mark chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. It says, no sign shall be given to this generation. With that, he left them and moved on. So he doesn't even mention Jonah by the time Mark comes along. So even in the earliest canonical gospels, so we can see that in the earliest account, they don't mention three days and three nights at all. So if the earliest one doesn't do it, where did this come from? So we can be sure, absolutely sure, that this was a later introduction into the narrative. It doesn't exist in the earlier text. And if you put it in, it actually works against your case. But like I said, I'm not going to go into more detail of that because greater scholars than I in comparative studies have done a far better job of answering that than I have. So if you haven't watched it, Make sure you get that video or order that CD or DVD or whatever it is, whatever technology is available now, get it. So you can watch it. It's very, very good. Now, on the story of raising from the dead or three days and three nights, if Jesus, the divine, or for some reason, he came out to earth in his human form and he became divine and he came down to planet earth and what the Christian says makes sense. Say we agreed with that. Say that he took on a human form and he was flesh and blood and was born like a human and that as a human he died. Then it is not required for him as this divine being to be resurrected on this earth. Because the mission according to Christianity is that the divine comes to earth, takes on the form of a human being, goes through the sufferings of a human being, is in the flesh as a human being, born like a human being, and will die like a human being, and like no other human being, he will raise up to God. It's not required for him to raise in his physical form. Now, the Christian is very confused on what this point is. He will fight for this, and he said, he had to be raised physically. Why? That's the question, why? The requirement for a sacrifice of sin is not the raising of the dead. The requirement for the sacrifice of sin is death. Something must bleed and die, not resurrect. Once the animal sacrifice was made in the old temple by the Jews, they did not wait three days later for the sheep to come into the temple and go, bah. they expected it to stay dead. No one wanted it to be alive. 
In fact, if they had seen a ghostly sheep running around, they would probably never come back to that temple again. Now, first of all, this would not determine the rising from the dead and does not make the person who rises from the dead divine. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, he was not divine. He was still the same human he had always been. In fact, if God in his mercy, and he has the right to do this, raised Jesus from the dead, if he did, it does not mean he's divine. It just means he's very fortunate. So Lazarus, if we look at the example where Christians often give talks and lectures, and they say Lazarus was a, an example of how Jesus would be raised from the dead, what happened to Lazarus in the future? 50 years later, 10 years later, 30 years later, we don't know the time period because, again, he's one of those characters you never hear of again. Lazarus eventually did die. And he did not ascend into heaven in his fleshly form. He died. He is in the ground. He is buried. But he will be raised again like every human being, but he will be raised in a new form, not in the old form. All flesh is mortal and all flesh is finite. Jesus must have to shed his body of flesh sometime in the future. And this is one of the reasons that we know he has to return to earth. Since people do not get raised in the flesh from the Bible, maybe some people will give references to two of the Old Testament stories that we will deal with a bit later. But other than that, people do not get raised in the flesh. The disciples refuse to believe that Mary Magdalene had even seen the raised Jesus. When she told them, remember, they said she was talking nonsense. There is no such thing as a dead person raising from the dead. The disciples, who Jesus had spoken to about his resurrection, understood what he was talking about. So if we look at the biblical text, there are countless numbers of problems with this narrative. But it is more likely that he was talking about a spiritual resurrection. Like I said before, many times in the series, we as Muslims do not agree with any of the theology that we are speaking about in this. Our theology is different to this. Our belief is different to this. We believe that he was spared from the cross, that he was taken to a place where he has been protected, and that he will come again in his physical form. But we'll deal with that later, inshallah. Now, when Mary and her companions saw him and saw that it was not Jesus that was there, Maybe when they saw this person that was in the garden, maybe when they saw this person when they thought that he had been resurrected, they thought that it was not him. They mistook him for somebody else. And so from the text, from the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, maybe it was not Jesus the resurrected, but it was Jesus the replacement. It wasn't Jesus that they saw, but it was the other person who was in his place. Or maybe it was the resuscitated. There are many options other than the option of Jesus being actually resurrected. There could be the replacement theory. There could be the resuscitated theory. Whatever it is, we know that it is not the text that is giving an accurate reflection. It is not what we as Muslims can accept. So, like I said, why raised from the dead in the first place? What is the purpose of being raised from the dead? In Luke chapter 16, verse 31, it says, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will pay no heed, even if someone should rise from the dead. In Luke chapter 16, verse 31, Even those people who refuse to listen to Moses and the prophets even if someone was to rise from the dead, they still would not listen. This is an interesting verse. Then what's the point of the resurrection? If Jesus already knows, if God Almighty is supposed to have already known this and saying that they didn't believe Moses, they didn't believe the prophets, if dead came back to life, they still wouldn't believe. What's the point then? If you already know that, don't get raised from the dead and just go straight to paradise as Christians have made us believe. 
go straight to heaven without stopping and walking around earth for 40 days, as one of the texts says. The other one is only two days or a day. And then he raises into the heavens. So the story doesn't make sense. There is no reason for the rising from the dead, especially when the fact of the rising from the dead is going to be done to a group of people that already are going to agree with the resurrection. It doesn't appear to people that will oppose the theory. It's easy to talk amongst a group of people that already agree with you. I remember going to America, and when I was there, I had to talk amongst a group of people, and they said to me, they will heckle you, and they will shout at you, and they will belittle you. And I said, well, that's the very people that I want to talk to. I'm not going to go stand and talk to a group of Muslims. They already know about Islam. So if Jesus was going to come to a group of people, he should have appeared to those people who hated him, to those people who doubted him, to those people that were not in agreement with him. And then we would have had good texts written today. And then we've offered you solutions that are more acceptable, not that we as Muslims agree or believe in this. In fact, we do not. But we are saying there are better theories. There are better explanations of the text than the ones that you are being told. The ones that people are giving you and saying, this is the truth. There are far better explanations that are more credible. Well, that's all the time we have for the program today. Make sure you join me again next episode, same place. So from me, Arib Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.